Hello and welcome to Expo. I hope that you're all doing well these days wherever you are and that you'll enjoy this episode of the podcast. My guest today is Jonathan Pieslack. Jonathan is a composer, music theorist and professor at the City College of New York. His current academic research is focused on the cultural dimensions of terrorism and of political violence and has been supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2011. His 2015 book, Radicalism and Music, that we discuss at length during the conversation, is a comparative study of the music cultures of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, of racist skinheads, of Christian-affiliated radicals, and of eco-animal rights militancy movements. We also get into Jonathan's current U.S. Department of Defense-funded team project, exploring the mobilizing influence of the jihadi Salafi movements in the world today. At the beginning of the interview, we discuss Jonathan's metal music theory papers, especially the influential recasting metal, rhythm and meter in the music of Meshuggah. We also talk about his body of work as a composer, and we mention his 2009 book, Sound Targets, American Soldiers and Music in the Iraq War. In a second, I am going to provide a short introduction to the radical movements that we compare and contrast. I will also succinctly present some of the individuals that we use as examples during the conversation, just so you know what and who we're talking about. As usual, there are timestamps in the description of the YouTube version of the podcast if you would like to skip to a specific part, and there are footnotes available at the end of the conversation that are indicated by this sound. Okay, so in Radicalism and Music, Jonathan Pieslack argues that music is a crucial part of radical culture. It plays a role in recruitment, indoctrination, and it often turns out to be an important trigger to action. Examples of that tendency in jihadi Salafi movements include the case of Arid Yuka, the perpetrator of the Frankfurt airport shooting, and of Azam and Khalid al-Awali, who bombed the US embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. In both cases, The terrorists were listening to Islamic chanted poetry, known as Anashid, right before the attack for, quote-unquote, motivation. Other infamous cases include the Curtis Colwell Center attackers, who posted violent lyrics on social media before the onslaught, or the infamous Boston Marathon bombers, who went out of their way to listen to Nasheeds while they were on the run. More systematically, between 2001 and 2011, Extremist videos and music were used as evidence in 59% of cases in which individuals were charged with offenses related to domestic radicalization and recruitment for jihadi groups. As a side note, it's important to acknowledge that only a minority of nasheeds feature extremist lyrics or advocate violence. Generally, they are very popular throughout the Islamic world and most of them are perfectly benign. On the far right... We have the cases of Wade Page, a white supremacist deeply involved in the racist skinhead music subculture who murdered six people at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin. And we have the case of Norwegian terrorist and mass shooter Anders Breivik, who went on, quote, self-indoctrination meditation walks in which he was listening to the racialist ballads of the Swedish singer Zaga. Matthew Hale is an example of a far-right religious radical that we mentioned during the conversation. He is the Pontifex Maximus of the Creativity Movement, a white supremacist pantheistic religion trying to bring about a racial holy war. I give more information about both Anders Breivik and Matthew Hale in the footnotes. The far-right is a constellation of a myriad different groups and ideologies that often contradict each other. And as a matter of fact, Lifelong commitment of members is the exception rather than the rule, as they tend to leave the scene after a few months of years only. During the conversation, we mentioned the Hamuskin Nation, which is one of the few groups that have managed to retain their members and to develop an international presence. This is in part due to the Hamuskin Nation's structuration, which is locally hierarchical and globally decentralized. Besides, music also occupies a prominent role in Christian-affiliated radical movements, such as the infamous Westboro Baptist Church, whose members use contrafacta. So, a contrafactum is a song whose original text was altered. 
They use contrafacta in conjunction with picketing to try to get as much attention as possible and to elicit anger and outrage. Other movements such as CEF, Child Evangelism Fellowship and Kimi, Kids in Ministry International, also use music as an integral part of the indoctrination process along with practices such as glossolalia, also known as quote-unquote speaking in tongues, and the induction of altered states of awareness. On the far left, radical environmental and animal rights activists, we use the abbreviation RIARA during the podcast, use songs to motivate listeners to take violent or illegal action. Such acts can take the form of arson, of tree spiking, and of targeting people involved in animal or environmental exploitation. So for people who don't know, tree spiking consists in hammering a metal rod or a nail inside of a tree. It's actually harmless for the tree, but it diminishes its market value and it damages or it tends to damage the saws that are used to cut it. The ALF, Animal Liberation Front, and the ELF, Earth Liberation Front, are two prominent radical collectives based on a model of leaderless resistance, meaning that they have no official leader or spokesperson but that they encourage direct action undertaken by autonomous individuals or by covert cells. In his book, Ecoterrorism, criminologist Donald Liddick evaluates that roughly 10% of crimes committed by RIRA activists would qualify as terrorism under American law. Genres that tend to be associated with eco-animal rights movements are singer-songwriter music and vegan straight edge, which is a variety of hardcore punk. More details about the straight edge movement can be found in the footnotes. Two activists that come up in our conversation are Walter Bond and Rodney Coronado. Walter Bond is a vegan straight edge ALF activist who was arrested in 2010 for the arsons of a sheepskin factory, of a leather factory and of a restaurant selling foie gras. He was also imprisoned for four years in 97 for burning down a large meth operation along with the house of the drug dealers, according to supportwalter.com. Rodney Coronado is an activist of Native American heritage that has been associated with ALF, ELF, Earth First, and Sea Shepherd. He was jailed for a 1992 arson attack on Michigan State University's Animal Research Center and from releasing mink from its breeding facility. The Animal Enterprise Protection Act, revised and retitled Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act in 2006, was enacted largely due to this incident to facilitate the prosecution of animal rights activists. So, that was a quick rundown of the four general movements that are explored in Jonathan Pieslack's book. Beyond simply comparing and contrasting these movements, he argues in the book that music is best understood as having a Janus-faced nature. Janus is the Roman god of beginnings and endings, of duality, transitions and gates. And he is usually represented with two or sometimes four faces. And so this all means that Jonathan Pieslack objects to a naive construal of music as a positive medium that can sometimes fall prey to hijacking. He proposes instead to understand it as a neutral cultural tool that can serve either unity or division, and that these reprehensible ideologies are different manifestations of the same dark side of the human experience. This approach allows us to consider the common features that exist between the different radical groups at hand, because despite their diametrically opposed ideologies, their methods and demographics bear striking similarities. For example, a majority of radicals are young men, Their ideas and actions are often framed as rightful defense against a clearly defined oppressor and ideas such as absolute truth and moral purity are held paramount. Interestingly, extremists sometimes implement strategies gleaned from other movements. For instance, Anders Breivik claims to have studied the strategies used by Al-Qaeda and Pastor Fisher of Kimi justifies the importance of indoctrinating young Christians to, quote, lay down their lives for the gospel by saying that this is exactly what they do in, quote, Pakistan, Israel, and Palestine. Parallels can also be drawn between the music of opposed radical groups. Their lyrical themes are similar. Contrafacta are widely popular, 
and the genres used are sometimes related. For example, it's hard to differentiate racist hardcore from straight edge only by listening to it, although the ideologies in question could not be more different. Songs are also widely used as a propaganda tool, as activists understand that potential new recruits tend to be primarily attracted to the emotional potency of the music and to the camaraderie between members of the group before they start to subscribe to the ideology. This is why the quality of the music in question is so important. One of the reasons why the Anashid made by ISIS have been so successful is their increased production value with the use of tools such as autotune, reverb, pitch shifting, EQ, etc. The age of exposure is also perceived to be a critical factor, which is why militants go out of their way to get music into the hands of children and teenagers. Music is used as a community building tool that can bring people together and create intergroup cooperation much more surely than ideology. During the conversation, we mentioned the case of Resistance Records, a music label that edited a magazine and published the music of racist and neo-Nazi musicians. After a tax read that almost led to the company's demise, Resistance Records was financially rescued by William Pierce, then leader of the National Alliance. His subsequent acquisition of the label was accepted by skinheads partly because he was the writer of the infamous Turner Diaries and thus had considerable prestige in white supremacist circles. But on a deeper level, the worldviews the supporters of Resistance Records and of National Alliance were never reconciliated. The skinheads were considered by NA leaders to be, quote, sweaty drunks, human defectives, and freaks and weaklings. They were also criticized for being out of touch with their, quote, Nazi heritage. Pierce was known to dislike punk and hardcore music, and shortly after his death, the relationship between the National Alliance and the Skins imploded. Well, that's it for the introduction. I hope that it will help you get the most out of the conversation. And without further ado, here is Jonathan Pieslack. Hello, Jonathan Pieslack. Thank you for being on the podcast. I'm really glad to have you here. And uh, yeah, I'd like to start by asking you, can you please describe, could you describe your trajectory as a music theorist? Because at first glance, uh, when, when I looked at your research, it seems like you have very eclectic interests in very diverse areas of research. And so maybe I think that it would be interesting for listeners to have kind of a review of the evolution of your research interests over the years. Yeah, I, uh, I started as a classical music theorist or classically trained. Um, and I had a specific interest going back to my dissertation, which I think was 2002 or three, uh, in critical theory and kind of philosophy in music. Um, I also had a secondary interest in a lot of um, hard rock and metal um, analysis. That was kind of a secondary area that I enjoyed uh, quite a bit. And so I started off my career kind of working in, in those domains and um, shortly after I kind of started, I got into the field. Um, it was just happened to be around the time that the uh, Iraq war started. That started in March 2003. And um, my wife, who is an ethnomusicologist, um, and I were just talking about, um, I guess, what were some of the listening habits of uh, American soldiers and Marines who were deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. It turns out that I had uh, friends and family who were deployed at the time. And just, it was interesting, you know, just to talk to them about it. And the topic of music happened to come into our conversations. And my wife and I wound up spending a lot of time saying, well, you know, nobody's really talking about this in the field of musicology. Wouldn't this be an interesting topic to, to research? And she was doing her dissertation at the time. And um, I, I said, hey, you know, I, going to start looking at this. It seems like a really interesting um, aspect of music scholarship that's gone pretty much untouched. And um, that's really what kindled my interest in, in that um, side of things. As I was doing that research, I published a few articles related to hard rock and metal. I published one on corn. Mm -hmm. I think I sent to you, I published one on the rhythm and meter and mashuga as well as that has a sociocultural element to it as well. And uh, but from there, I really spent the time looking at and in, in researching music within the context of uh, soldiers' lives deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. Interestingly, and, and I think one of the really career-defining 
parts about that research was actually a peripheral chapter that I wrote in my book, Sound Targets, which is what addresses that topic. And in that chapter, um, I wanted to look at what the other side of the conflict was doing, what, what was happening musically there. Uh, I was getting a lot of information about what was going on from the side of American soldiers and Marines deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of them using music as an inspiration for combat. Uh, I was looking at it as a recruitment tool, as a source of motivation. And my, the question arose in my mind, well, what's going on on the other side? And at that time, it was about 2006, 2007. And that was uh, kind of the, the point at which there was the kindling Sunni insurgency. And they had unified under the name of the Islamic State of Iraq. And that group, of course, would go on to become probably the most successful jihadi terrorism group in history. Um, mm. Well, they're certainly not as prominently mobilized now. Um, they had unprecedented success, uh, more so than any other jihadi group. And so I've kind of been following them uh, for a long time. And after the publication of that book, uh, I was contacted by some other scholars who reached out to me and said, hey, this is a largely unexplored, again, uh, aspect of another field, well, or, or a field that isn't a field, but basically is terrorism and political violence, right? We use it as a big umbrella to talk about it, but it actually kind of really isn't a discipline in and of itself. So these were people from political science, people from sociology, other people who were studying um, the, the issue of jihadism, in particular, in particular, the idea of jihadi culture. And uh, I then participated in some workshops in Oslo led by a uh, fantastic uh, jihadism expert, Thomas Heghammer, um, and I just met a bunch of really wonderful colleagues and, and friends through that. And um, that really was the, the starting point for my interest in music in the processes of radicalization and within the larger field of terrorism and political violence. Mm -hmm. This uh, sociological approach within the field of music theory, is it something that has been progressively added to the field of music theory? Do most music theorists incorporate an element of uh, sociology in their research, or is it something that is more specific to your approach? Well, I think it was actually, I sort of switched disciplines, and, and I almost say that I, <laughs> I worked my way out of the field of musicology totally. Like, I really haven't been doing musicology, like, for the last decade, at least. Mm -hmm. Because I started, what was interesting is it actually uh, started with the work that I did on Meshuggah, and it was kind of related to the work I did with Korn and all that, and, and just really kind of thinking about it from a sociocultural perspective. Because when you started taking apart the notes, and I started looking at, at, at Meshuggah specifically, you kind of couldn't, you, you couldn't separate that from the idea that this was the, one of the most important things to fans, right? That in a way, like how some of the fans in that progressive or experimental or whatever genre label we want to give to that music, they really defined themselves as in a way, being more educated, being more sophisticated, and having an appreciation for these subtleties. Now, you know, if you hear about how they talk about it, it's funny because they, they use great terms and they use them all wrong and, and all that. It's, <laughs> it's kind of fun to, to do that, but like there really is an element of prestige uh, that they try to sort of afford themselves within the world, uh, sort of the metal subculture. And, you know, I, I kind of think about it like this, and, and it's, like, when I go to a Meshuggah show, I don't see guys wearing, like, a corn t-shirt, right? And, and that tells you a lot. Whereas if I go yeah, to a yeah. show and I wear a Meshuggah shirt, like, I'm kind of saying something, right? I'm mm. okay. I'm going to get a pass. Nobody's going to, you know, you know, try to beat me up or anything. But, like, I'm also saying, like, hey, I have an appreciation for this more complex thing, you know? Um, and that was a really fascinating part about it because what – I found is that a lot of scholarship on, on metal and hard rock had originally approached it from kind of a sociocultural perspective. Had a lot of times been sociologists um, and people looking at it, and, and they were right to do it. A lot of pop music scholarship was about the sociocultural dimensions of pop music. And those were the more interesting ones, right? You're not gonna find you know, a lot of mainstream pop rock that, you got four chords, right? You're not going to find a whole lot. I mean, there's neat stuff to talk about in Ed Sheeran, but at the same time, you sort of hit a point at which you're, you're missing the larger point. Um, and so what I found is that when you take, when you start from a sociocultural perspective with a band like Meshuggah, 
you have to find your way to the notes. And my process was a little bit the other way and that I was starting with the notes and you couldn't ignore the fact that there was this larger sociocultural context in which all of this was operating. Um, so I, I don't think it's in the field of musicology, there are a variety of sub-disciplines and, and theorists tend to you know, talk about you know, the notes, let's just we generalize terribly. So I apologize to every music theorist out there. Uh, that you know, the theorists tend to look at aspects of pitch and rhythm and things like that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you kind of have what we would call the field of ethnomusicology, which really do, is largely derivative from the field of anthropology and uses a lot of theoretical frameworks from that field to discuss music. And they draw on a lot of different things. So they'll draw on sociology, they draw on critical theory, they draw on a lot of different disciplines. Um, and so you know, think about it, one, on one side of the spectrum you have theory, they're looking at the notes and rhythm and that type of thing. On the other end, you have something that's largely um, driven by sort of anthropology. And it doesn't mean that you don't get people in theory who do sociocultural stuff or things that would qualify as ethnomusicology. And it doesn't mean that an ethnomusicologist doesn't look at the notes specifically. But kind of broadly speaking, you know, that, that's more or less generally what how I would describe it to like a grad student who's interested in those academic disciplines. Yeah, that's very interesting because actually, yeah, you kind of went the other way. You mentioned in your current paper about Hey Daddy, for example, that a lot of the scholarship up till then had been done on sociocultural aspects. You mentioned the seminal uh, 93 paper by Walser. Mm -hmm. And you said that this, um, that there is a musical poetic perspective that is missing. And this is what you're trying to bring in that corn paper. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that and how, how was the field at the time? How did it look and how was your paper different in its approach? Yeah, I think that back, back then, I think it was just kind of like the early 2000s, uh, mid 2000s, that I think a lot of the field of popular music scholarship and particularly the scholarship that was done on hard rock and metal music was largely interested in the, the, the subculture, the subcultural dimensions of it. Um, Rob Walzer published a fantastic book, Running with the Devil, and he, he talked about in their sort of like classical appropriations of virtuosity in, in metal music, particularly throughout the 80s. And um, what I was really interested in exploring in that song that I looked at was pretty much a paper about one song, Corn's Hey Daddy was how were elements of what was going on poetically, what were the lyrics about? Um, and Jonathan Davis's lyrics can be really you know, tragic and moving um, at times. And uh, how were those elements, were certain elements of the, the lyrics and the meaning being reflected in musical dimensions? Um, of it even ranging to, you know, what were, what were pitches doing? How could we you know, potentially understand those things as being reconciled? How, how is the affective potency of the, the song coming through musical elements? So in a sense, it's more of a, you're more focused on the individual experience of like a given listener and trying to explain how his or her experience would be like listening than maybe from the more social and group aspect of the music. Oh, yeah. In that paper, absolutely. It was much more about an individual approach to listening rather than, in a sense, trying to get at the heart of what uh, you might think of as the subcultural community and elements of sort of community reception or those types of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of that had, had been done already. You know, uh, Harris Berger wrote some great stuff on that. Um, there have been a lot of people, you know, most of the scholarship at that time had been sociocultural in relation to rock and metal and um, I think with, with very good reason, um, you know, there, I, I don't know that there's a lot to talk about in terms of the pitches and rhythms of, you know, Warrant or Motley Crue and stuff like that, you know, like, okay, Home Sweet Home has a really cool, like, progression where it moves down and you kind of get this flat six to flat seven in the chorus. There's kind of like this modal mixture thing and you sort of uh -huh. get, the, you know, it's, it's pretty cool, but like, Oh, okay, that's it. Like, <laughs> you're not going to get a paper out of that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Talking about the uh, uh, recasting metal paper that you wrote about Meshuga in 2008 and that you published in, I think it was Music Theory Spectrum, the, yes. the journal. So yeah. that, was a, that was a turning point, at least for the music theory scholars that focus on metal that I have had the chance to talk mm -hmm. uh, to up till now because they all 
quote your paper. So it was a seminal paper in some ways. And it seems that uh, the, difference, the difference there was that you used uh, classical music theory tools. I mean, not classical, but you used um, academical music theory tools to analyze a phenomenon that was more considered pop music theory. So can you tell me a little bit about how you had the idea of studying uh, Meshuggah this way? And um, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, in that paper, really what I'm looking at is, I look at two things specifically. And the first thing I look at is I describe how a lot of their riffs and grooves unfold and the idea of metric superimposition. And there are a lot of different ways to describe it. Um, but it was kind of like, here's what's going on in a lot of the riffs and grooves. Um, and that's, that's an interesting part, but I, I don't think that that's all that sort of phenomenal, so to speak. Um, I think what was really interesting is that around that time, or it had been the early 2000s, I think it was, what, 2003 that they released I. Um, and there are sections of that track that are just like sort of, I, I was like, this isn't, they're not do, they're doing the same thing, but they're doing it quite differently. Um, kind of the same idea of symmetrical hypermeter as guiding sort of large blocks of, of music. And, but this isn't sort of very simply explained. Um, and I think that was, to me, the really interesting part about that article. So my, my goal was really to kind of unpack I and certain sections of I where I thought that it was kind of unique insofar as they weren't doing you know, they're, they're large scale symmetrical structures, the stuff that guided it was the same as they all had always used. But what was happening on the inside was very different. And I tried, I, I'm a bass player. I'm an old bass player, you know, like I, I always have that performer perspective going in. And I thought to myself, the thing I remember, I thought to myself, well, it, there's no way you can perform this live, right? You can't keep all this stuff together because if you get off, well, it's all over. Right, because nothing comes back for another 45 seconds, you know, or we don't switch things. Whereas if you get off in some of the other riffs that I, you know, was playing, the other Meshuggah riffs, I was like, well, actually, you can get yourself back on pretty easily. Like, even if you get really off, you just wait for the thing to cycle back for four bars of four four, and you're able to get yourself back on. Whereas with with I, there were big stretches in there. That I was like, I don't. If if you get off, it's really over. Um, and so, and I think you actually see that because I, I'm not aware that they've ever performed even sections of it live. Um, and I, I was also very interested in, um, then understanding how that stuff was put together. And, and so how do you perform it? How do you record it? Um, I, I've always been very interested in how, what I'm doing from a musical theoretical perspective can inform composition, performance, how can we use this? Um, I, I'm very interested in kind of understanding that. And I'm not at all saying, and I think one of the things I should definitely clarify is that I'm not at all saying that this is compositional intent. Those two are very different things. I'm suggesting how I understand it, how I believe it's put together. I'm not saying that the Meshuggah guys thought about it this way. You know, ever since I published that article, they've always been saying, no, we're just in 4-4 and blah, blah, blah. And this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, and, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I met Thomas and, and, and Fred and it's just like, you know, they, they look at the diagrams that I have and they're like, yeah, whatever. Um, but it's, you know, they're always like, it's four, four. And I'm like, yeah, you're, it's, it's a pretty interesting four, four. And when you do this, you know, when you, when you play an eye, like it's really, really cool. And I found, uh, that the application of certain ways of thinking of, of kind of understanding pitch and rhythm within uh, classical music were really easy, easily sort of fit in to mm -hmm. this, and particularly the idea of sort of like numeric strings, where you would put like a two would represent a quarter note, a one would represent an eighth note, a three would represent a dotted quarter note, and you attach those to certain pitches, and then you have these strings that sort of line up as it could be two, two, one, three. Two, two, three, one, one, two, something like that. And it's like, ah, all of a sudden I can see patterns that emerge within that. And it's way easy for me to play instead of actually dealing it from like a notated musical perspective, which, you know, most of these musicians aren't dealing with it from. So it was kind of like that idea. And I felt that I could bring in that way of analyzing to kind of create these maps 
that showed how, you know, a couple minutes of music unfolded in ways that were derivative from what they were doing before mm -hmm. in terms of the large scale ordering and having sort of symmetrical hypermeter their quote unquote four, four, but you could also see how this was much more interesting uh, going on than just saying, well, here's a riff that instead of being in four, four, we're just going to either chop it off a little bit or elongate it a little bit and make sure that we all line up in the same place. You know, sort of a, a, a four four idea of what happens in a lot of minimalist music where you just start some a, a pattern that's in five or then you start a pattern that's in three and they'll eventually line themselves up right after a certain number well you just do that within the framework of four four hypermeter and and that's really kind of the the gist of what it is that they do yeah. but in i it's on a much bigger level and you don't get the articulation of those small repeated group smaller groupings Yeah, I mean, for me, reading the, that paper, maybe the thing that struck me the most and that I thought was the most interesting is the concept that you use from Yeston, the concept of uh, attack point interval. Mm -hmm. And it seems that in your research, like, for example, you mentioned your uh, doctorate thesis, and that was kind of, a, I mean, from what I understand, a meta music theory thesis in the sense that you looked at different a way of doing music theory, so neo-Romanian, mm -hmm. Schenkerian, and uh, Schoenbergian. And you kind of compared and contrast how the descriptive power of each other, the relative advantages and disadvantages. And so it was really interesting for me that you would use, yeah, attack point, uh, I mean, what you called architectural analy uh, rhythmic mm -hmm. analysis. Yeah. And different ways of representing the music, because as you said, the guys from Meshuggah claim it's 4-4. Thomas Hawker, he said in an interview, it's all random. Nobody knows how <laughs> I goes. And actually, and which is quite a feat in my opinion, which I thought was super interesting, you have managed to draw parallels in beat. So you show that in a way there is order that can emerge from it because it's not totally random. You can see patterns re-emerging and being truncated and turned and uh, reused in different ways. And something that you pointed out in your paper is that the polymetric metric superimposition approach kind of blinds us from seeing the fact that, for example, if you take rational gaze, the, set, the cells from rational gaze are derived from one another. They are derivative from one another, and it's true that it's something that you don't really see at all. Right. Yeah, so there I thought that was very interesting. Uh, well, thanks. I, I, I also found there was, there was a guy I want to mention. I, the guy's name was Nick Wolf, and mm -hmm. I believe um, Nick was writing an undergraduate thesis somewhere in the UK, and I've tried to reach out to him. Um, and he was doing some work on Dillinger Escape Plan. And I think he was looking at like 43% burned or something. I, I don't know what, what song he was looking at exactly. But he was like, you know, I'm trying to make sense of this type of thing. And he sent me a transcription. I'll never forget this. Like he sent me a transcription that he had worked up of that. And it was just spot on. And I was totally blown away. I, I was totally humbled by his transcription chops. This was you know, amazing. But what was really fascinating is that he, he was trying to look at it through notated music. And I said, one of the, you have to kind of think in, in a performer way, right? Because I've seen Dillinger play a lot. And I was like, well, how do they keep this all together, right? Because it does feel very random, right? When Thomas says, oh, it's random, nobody knows, all this type of stuff. Well, you're keeping it together somehow. And if you go see Dillinger, or when they were together, when you saw Dillinger perform, they were such dynamic performers, but they were a tight band. Like, this just wasn't, you know, just noise. They, it was really sophisticated stuff they were playing. So I, I kept thinking, well, how do they put it together? And I suggested to him the idea that at times they're kind of working with those attack point intervals or the idea of numbers, some way of figuring out in a numeric string that keeps everything together, right? So whether that be like a three, three, two, three, three, one, three, something like that, but something I can keep together as a performer. And that helps me through. And Um, we started do, fiddling around with that song in that way and, and you started seeing exactly in a different way but you started seeing the same types of things you started seeing patterns emerge the same types of things you, you saw in Meshuggah but it, it suggested to me kind of the utility of that approach and also one that I think is derived from how the artists themselves are perhaps thinking about it again I want to separate myself from saying this is how they're doing it and I found the secret this tends to be a really 
you know, everybody loves doing that. I unlocked the key of this complicated thing and I'm not at all saying that, just saying that it makes a lot of sense to use that way because that's how I would approach it if I were, you know, if I joined a Dillinger cover band, that's what I would do, right? Yeah. That's how I make sense of it. Um, of course, but this uh, concern with perspective, I mean, it seems to me to make total sense. I don't know if you're aware of Smialek paper about Mishuga, but mm -hmm. in it, he describes a part of, uh, um, I mean, it's on catch 33. Mm -hmm. And I think he uses a finger diagram. So he shows you that this like bunch of notes that don't seem to make sense is just a, <laughs> It's just yep. the musicians playing with the same finger pattern and just yep. moving, moving it in different ways, which is yep. brilliant. I mean, it's yep. really... So yeah, that's a, that's a good example of what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's really important, particularly for players, when you think about some of this progressive stuff, to understand the, the performative side of it, to understand how the music originates. You know, the guitar is about shapes, right? It's like, you know, when, I, when I teach my, my students and we talk about, like, compositional instruments and I deal with pianists and then I show them a guitar and I'm like, this is how you play a major scale on a guitar or a bass. And they're like, that's it. I just learned one fingering pattern. And, and like the look in their eye is just like, Oh my God, like I, this is so different from piano where you got to learn all the different fingerings, you know, just to get through the major scales. So you're right. Like that, that's such a great point that he makes in that article, which is look at the shapes, look at how the functional elements of performing the instrument, impact the composition mm -hmm. and I think that's something that sometimes we lose a bit in our analytical perspective because we're so focused on the notes that we don't focus on elements of performance and um, sort of the compositional basis of a lot of the instruments yeah so yeah by the way I just remembered that's in death is death I think that's the second part of it that yeah. I just mentioned yeah. uh, by the way about Meshuga and maybe last question about Meshuga um, do you feel like there has been, how do you feel about the evolution of Meshuga? Because I also thought that the time when you, when you wrote your paper is a very interesting time because at the time you were aware of Catch-33 and I, and at that point it looked like Meshuga had been getting crazier and crazier over the years, you know, and nobody knew where they were headed. But with Obzen in 2008, and then that was confirmed by the later albums, they kind of, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's more simple, but it's like they, they didn't, they stopped going, they got out of that lane of getting more and more progressive and conceptual. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I wonder, how do you feel about Meshuggah in 2020? Well, I love them, you know, I, I feel <laughs> like, you know, I don't think that they've lost any credibility. I actually have to give those guys a lot of credit. Like they've, they've stuck to it, right? And I think that sometimes we can be, a little bit like, you know, I think it just sort of, it just, it's interesting to me if, if, not that we say that you create a brand and you stick to it, but that's kind of what tends to happen to a lot of people. I mean, it's, it's you do have artists that sort of reimagine themselves and are able to do that. But it, by and large, like most of the time, people kind of find a groove and they stick with it, right? If I, if I go to a concert and I go to a classic musical concert and there's a Philip Glass piece on there. I kind of know what I'm going to get because Philip's more or less been doing the same thing for a long time, right? I go, John Adams is on there. Michael Doherty's on there. Um, you know, anybody, right? Chris Rouse. I, I kind of know what I'm going to get, right? Mm -hmm. And in a way, like, they've been more or less doing the same thing. They haven't really kind of, like, redefined themselves. And I think, like, it was really just the band pulling together that synergy and finding their voice. And they found it and that was the, and you risk a lot if you start, if, or I think that it can also be a lot of pressure to try to just sort of stay in a way like cutting edge. You can, going back a long time, like look at Radiohead, right? Like they, they had their thing, right? And I could always tell that it was Radiohead and they kind of like, you know, I, I guess like they're, I don't want to say that these are bands that find a voice and then they don't evolve at all. But um, I guess long story short, I'm pretty happy with where they are right now. Yeah, like yeah. I, I, lo I love uh, their stuff and they, they found a thing. I actually I really appreciate the fact that they seem, interestingly, seem to have within the metal subculture still retained a great deal of authentic, authentic or currency of authenticity, we might call it, right? Even though, right, with Ubs, and that was kind of their move into whatever we might call the mainstream, right? And, and they really are the fathers of Gent, 
right? And everybody goes back. And they, some of those gent bands, you know, Periphery, some of these other gent bands are really popular. They sell a lot of albums. And um, you kind of have to say, like, in terms of sort of mainstream metal scene, it really shifted. You say, like, all right, early 2000s, you kind of had the, the new metal, whatever that was. But you say, like, bands like Corn, and it sort of shifted to more of the gent popular bands. And they really have their founding fathers in, in Meshuggah, but they don't seem to have lost any of that credibility uh, yeah. um, within the, the metal subculture um, that you might see kind of lose. Think about Metallica, right? And it was like, well, they, they were great up until like, you have people who love them up to the Black Album and then people who, you know, are like, well, that's, you know, Andrew Sandman killed them, right? Or everybody who's like, that was the start of Metallica for them. Yeah, um, of course. So... I, they, they seem to have weathered that storm pretty well. I mean, in the case of Meshuggah, I didn't mean to say that they stopped innovating, but it's very interesting how they kind of changed lanes. And now they, I mean, for example, the last album was recorded in a studio mm -hmm. and was not just like uh, overdubbed like they did all the previous albums. Yeah. And of course, like uh, Dr. Olivia Lucas, for example, mm -hmm. I know does a lot of research on how they now use lights and uh, on all these systems. So yeah, they keep on innovating in a different direction. It's very interesting, as you said, that it's true that in the meantime, since, since you've written this article, uh, they have completely, they have fathered a new subgenre. You know, Gent has been, and probably now is going down a little bit. So yeah, it's very interesting to, to see that. By the way, I wanted to ask you as well, because uh, Jonathan, you're also a composer. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so I'd like to know how you being a music theorist and maybe... I mean, for example, you wrote this piece for Percussion Quartet, that's mm -hmm. it. And that seems to be, the title seems to be inspired from Meshuggah's Dancers to a Discordant System. So I'd like to know how, like, the bands that you study and you being a music theorist play into your being a composer and a creative person. Oh, that's a really good question. You know, absolutely. The, the title is sort of an honorific to uh, Meshuggah. And, um, but I say that, you know, that's probably about as far as it goes. Um, because I, I'm very, very skeptical of kind of what we might think of as sort of like too much of a crossover element, right? Meaning that like, I'm, if you're writing a percussion quartet and you sort of think of yourself as being a new music or classical composer, um, oftentimes trying to bring in too much of an element of another genre, um, is, fantastically unsuccessful. Um, I tried it and it doesn't work really well. Like in a sense of like, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm thinking, well, what would Meshuggah write for a percussion quartet? Like, well, that's not a good place to start um, because you're just starting from such a different place. And so I'm kind of, I'm always skeptical about the idea of bringing in too much of that element from another genre, particularly like, rock and metal or hip hop or stuff like that into what we might think of as a concert music setting. Um, so I, I think that it impacts me just in, in the general way in terms of a sensibility about it. I like things that, that groove. I like things that have pulse. I like things that in a way I can nod my head to. Um, I like things that in a way move energetically very similar to some of that music. Um, there tends to be a lot of sort of big stuff that happens and then there'll be backups and then big stuff that happens. And so it's more quite general rather than saying, well, um, you know, this is how Tosa Nabasi would write a symphony, you know, like I'm not trying to, to, to do that. Um, I'm, I'm much more uh, interested kind of in the general power of the music and, and certain sort of larger things about it. Um, but I, I, I gain a lot from it. Um, actually, I think in a way, like a lot of Ben Weinman stuff from Dillinger Escape Plan would actually translate better. Like I hear some of his stuff and I was like, Ooh, that would be super cool as like, do have cellos do that or something like that. Um, I do find inspiration from it, but in a way, like I, I I'm very hesitant and, and I'll certainly admit that I, I wrote a few pieces in the early 2000s that tried to do it and, and really, <laughs> I, I wasn't successful at it. Maybe somebody else out there will be much more successful at it. But uh, when I really tried to directly apply some of those compositional techniques within a concert music framework, um, 
it, it didn't work well, which is why you don't listen to those pieces, Baptiste, because I don't, I don't post them anywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought it was interesting because you have this piece on your album Shards in, uh, in 2008 called Pred Insomnia, and you mm -hmm. published three versions of it. And so I thought that it was interesting, knowing that you're a music theorist, that you would maybe see it as a deeper structure that can be either played on a piano Mm -hmm. or using an electric guitar simulation or being played by, I think it was a quartet as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say, I mean, that is always, I don't know, I don't know if I agree with what you just said, because actually one of my favorite piano pieces on the internet is a version of 43 person burnt by a guy <laughs> who plays it on piano and it's absolutely glorious. Mm -hmm. I really loved it. So, and I thought it was really interesting to listen to that piece of yours and also Spiral that you, mm -hmm. and you also have a different arrangement. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I thought it was very interesting. Well, to I think I remember it's, it's about where it starts. I think what I'm is what I'm trying to say is that like it's easy to you can pick things out and translate them, right? Meaning that like I with certain pieces you can do that. Um, I think with Prednisomnia you could do it with Spiral you could do it um, with Shards. I'm talking about some of the, the pieces that I had on that piano album, and it works. It can work in some cases, um, but I think generally speaking, like when I hear. Um, when I hear like Tool for string quartet, it kind of lacks something, right? Yeah. It, 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 you know what I mean? Like, and so I've seen a lot of those ever where like, here's Alice in Chains for whatever, you know? And it, it, it doesn't kind of come across really well. I don't think that it, it, it works so much. And I, what I find is those sort of, those pieces, and by the way, please send me the link because I wasn't aware of that. I'd love to hear that. Oh yeah. Um, definitely send it to me. Um, I, I guess it's just more about a starting point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, if I want to do kind of a mini uh, auto ethnography for a second, maybe what I love the most about that 43% uh, burn piano piece is that it's subtractive in a sense because I know the original by Dillinger. And so I get to, to see how does what you did there. That's how you decided to translate that. Mm -hmm. And so the fun is more there then it's like reading a translation of your favorite book in, a, in another language that you know, for example. Yeah. So maybe that is what it, what's interesting about it. I think that's a very good analogy. Yeah, I absolutely think so. I think it would be, it'd be interesting to try to see how that piece would be received by someone who didn't know the original. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like a jazz standard, you know, where they get more and more further away from the original because everybody's supposed to know the original. And so yeah. that's where the creativity lies. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'd love to talk about your latest book, the one mm -hmm. that was published in uh, 2015, Radicalism and Music. There is a ton of information there, and I would love to take a deep dive into it. So, Absolutely. so yeah, actually, you're, from what I understand, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, your thesis in the book is that the role that music plays in radical movements is underestim underestimated mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, indoctrination, propaganda, and recruitment. And that music itself is a generous, you, you say, generous-faced tool in the sense that it's not good or positive by nature, but it can be used differently by different movements. And so in that book, you, you zero in on four different movements. You talk about Al-Qaeda and ISIS. You talk about racist skinheads and race fakes. And you talk about Christian-affiliated radicalism, as well as on the left side. You talk about um, radical environmentalists and animal rights activists. And so my first question would be to ask you, why did you ch choose specifically these four movements? Well, I wanted to provide a diversity. It was basically it's a comparative study that looks at a diverse number of, of movements to the extent that I could approach them. And I chose those movements specifically because you had elements of what you might call far left, far right, and you had religious movements as well. So I kind of wanted to include things that covered uh, the political and religious spectrum. So um, for instance, you know, obviously the um, eco-animal rights militancy movements were kind of a far leftist movement. And while they do in a sense have elements of religious thought, but they're, they're not specifically entrenched in religion the way that Christian fundamentalism or um, jihadism is entrenched in, in religion, the same way with um, elements of the American racist skinhead movement. So I was just really trying to as cast my net as broadly as possible within my comparative study. Okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that you had to go through 
in a way, a personal process to approach these subjects in the sense that you had to be self-reflective about biases you may have. Mm -hmm. And also something that I'm very interested in because you've been studying this thing for more than 10 years. Um, I mean, I, I really, I mean, myself, just reading your book and watching some of the pro propaganda that you referenced, sometimes I find it really hard to, uh, to stay neutral and it was very hard to detach. Mm -hmm. And especially some of the ISIS propaganda that is really uh, traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, what was your process? How, how do you shelter yourself from the, from the adverse effects? Um, well, first talk about a little bit about how I, I approached it, and then I'll talk about the, the steps that I, that I took personally just to um, make sure that you keep a, in a good psychological space because that, that's a very important thing. And we often talk about that within the field is uh, sort of the idea of protecting yourself um, psychologically because in studying this material, yeah, you, it's not fun to spend a lot of time with, um, particularly in the, the mid 2010s when uh, the Islamic State was producing so much of this um, and just be watching videos and videos. Um, but I, I was very fortunate in so far as with most of these groups, I was able to interact with them personally. Obviously, I wasn't able to do that with the jihadi, so I had a distance there. But I really had the benefit of being able to talk to them uh, personally. Um, I, I did an interview, for instance, with Steve Drain of the Westboro Baptist Church, which is probably the most hated you know, domestic group in the United States. Um, so we certainly were at the time that I was doing that. Uh, and it was really fascinating because uh, I always found a way to be able to relate to the people I was studying as people based off of an appreciation of certain music. It was interesting that like music was the topic of my study, but the music was kind of the way that I was able to um, kind of generate uh, a connection with a person. Um, so like being able to Steve Drain, we both, you know, I remember in the interview that I did with him, we both started talking about, you know, Alice in Chains' Dirt album when it came out and how it just sort of blew our minds. And we were both about the same age. And, and just after that, like, after making that connection, you know, obviously I have a lot of differences with the Westboro Baptist Church, but we were, we were able to have a very sort of calm discussion about music and how it played a role within their group. Um, the same way with some of the, the racist skinhead guys I talk to when I go to shows, like, you realize, like, all you gotta do is start just talking about different bands, right? And then you immediately had this bond, you know? You could talk about, hey, that's a, that's a great song. And then that shared like of something brought me together. And in a way, I was able to, it, it helped me humanize them. Um, mm -hmm. Because, and, and also, like, the, the idea, one of the things that I had going into this, and it was a good lesson, was that, at least for me, and I know it's a controversial point in, in the field was that I, I really wasn't trying to use my scholarship as social activism. And that's a big thing. And a lot of people don't will say, no, it's inherently socially activist. You should embrace that role. I, I get it. Um, but I, I realized that I'm not going to change anybody's mind with my research. And, and the idea that I go into a conversation with someone who espouses these views or was in one of these groups, um, as being totally idiotic and all right, well, you're just an ignorant, you know, Southern guy who's from a lower, you know, socioeconomic level and you're just an ignorant white guy who's racist for no reason. Um, it doesn't do a whole lot, um, except to actually further entrench them in those views. And when you can find commonality with a person, then I think you can start having conversations and, um, then you can understand them a little better. It's not to, in a way, give them a pass out of some of their views, but it, it really was something that um, helped me in my, my research considerable amount. Um, I remember I wrote to a guy by the name of Matt Hale, who was the leader of the creativity movement, and he was uh, in prison uh, at the time, and he, but he was a huge classical music lover. And while his love of classical music, it was, this was interesting because he, his love of classical music was entirely rooted in the idea that it was emblematic of white racial superiority. And to him, if you enjoy classical music, well, that inherently made you someone who was recognizing the supremacy of this white 
uh, product, this, this cultural product that was distinctly white and emblematic of white superiority. Um, and so it was just interesting that when you, you took that stuff out, it was really easy to kind of be like, hey, I, he was a violinist. So it would be like, hey, I love this Prokofiev piece. You know, and once you started talking that way, it was, um, I felt that the conversations unfolded a lot better and um, the whole process worked, worked a lot better. I think I was able to get a lot more information that way. And, and I re certainly recognize that, that research, academic research is in, you know, in its inherently in way socially activist, but um, you know, if, if we're doing social activism, we're certainly doing it the wrong way if we're going to spend years writing academic books that sell several hundred copies, you know, honestly. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a little bit of a blunt way of hitting back at the other side. But, um, you know, if I wanted to do social activism, I can find a much better way of being um, effective as a social activist than to sit in an ivory tower and write books. Yeah. Um, there you go. There's, there's your controversial thing for the academic <laughs> <laughs> You wanted me to say something provocative. There you go. Yeah. I mean, um, actually, I thought that it was an interesting approach when you said, actually, in the introduction of the book, that your point, in a way, was to characterize and represent the views of people so that they would not be, for example, Matthew Hale himself reading the book would not be, oh, that's a misportrayal of what I think. They would be like, oh, that's exactly what I think, whether they be jihadists or Riera activists or whoever. There was, a, I know that there was a Westboro Baptist uh, documentary that, that was done and anybody who's ever interviewed Westboro Baptist, like they, they've always had kind of the same MO. And um, I remember distinctly in one documentary where they were talking to someone and they, they said to this guy, they were like, listen, you're gonna get in a lot of trouble if you do this because you're not sort of taking this very firm stand against us. And it, it, that was always very interesting to me. And I tried to take the same approach. I was like, well, what happens if Westboro Baptist Church, you know, what happens if Steve Drain reads my book? Like, I, I want him to say, actually, yeah, that's, that's accurate. And then leave it to him to defend th their views, right? It's, it's not for me to cast in one way or another. The same way with, the, you know, the, the guys in the racist skinhead movement. Yeah, absolutely. I want this to be a very accurate portrayal. And be like, I'm well represented in the, this research as, you know, a, as this being a, an accurate understanding of what happens in our, our subculture rather than something that is really just out to paint them in a certain way. Mm. But in a way, there is also like a bias that you are bound to have in the sense that because you are American um, and because also you're a white guy, for example, you're allowed to go to a skinhead concert and talk with people there, but maybe you're not able to like have an interview or a discussion with a jihadist. I mean, actually, I think you interviewed the Hibs Uttarir uh, activists, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. also the fact that I don't know if you speak Arabic, I swear. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Um, so that's you know, very important, I guess, if you're studying these movies. Yeah, it is. Um, but, you know, in, in that field of jihadism studies, I think it's also important to understand that, like, having the cultural and religious background um, is, is critically important. And I find that the people who do this the best are those people who have that background. Uh, which is why I've always sought to collaborate with, you know, really fantastic people. Nellie Lahoud is a fantastic scholar. Mm -hmm. um, love her work. And I've published with her numerous times um, as, as a co-author. And even with the articles we published in Thomas Heckhammer's book, Jihadi Culture, uh, that was originally supposed to be a, a joint authored piece. We just both had too much to say. Um, so uh, I firmly recognize that. And, and in a way, like, I, I feel like I'm, better suited to do some of the white nationalist stuff. Um, and I was able to get access to that subculture, in a, as, as you point out, rightly, uh, in a much deeper way because, you know, honestly, I just, you know, cut my hair a little short and put on a black t-shirt, jeans, and I'm in there, right? And, and there's yeah. no problem. Um, whereas a, a lot of other colleagues can't do that. I mean, it's extremely cosmetic. And you talk about it as well when you, in the second chapter, in which you mentioned uh, racist skinheads and you mentioned the Hammerskin Nation and how they are one of the few skinhead, racist skinhead groups that have managed to stay somewhat stable because they put like uh, 
a lot of importance on, on being there on having been there for a long time and improving yourself and all of that stuff. And so I wonder if you could talk about the, uh, the inherent transitory aspect of this, these racist scenes, because it's not something that we talk a lot about, but that is probably a very important part of it. Mm-hmm. I think it is, and it touches upon a number of interesting points. I think the first is that I noticed a distinct similarity between what were the racist skinhead subculture in the United States, as well as kind of eco-animal rights militancy uh, culture in, in the United States. And um, it was interesting to me, I, I don't know if it was in the book, but I, I remember reading an interview with a guy who was a former member of a racist skinhead group. And he kind of said, you know, when you hit middle age in life, you sort of just lose the energy and the momentum that you had for the movement because it's so driven by hate. Um, and that's, that's something that, a word that appears a lot in their uh, band names, definite hate. There's a lot of hate, 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 right? Um, and he made the point that after a while, when that is what's fueling your motivation, that you run out of, that, that it has an expiration. Um, that you eventually hit a point in midlife where, you know, what perhaps was very motivating and the, the anger and angst that one had maybe in their mid twenties, um, it's not there anymore. And that's to a large degree explains why you, you don't see a lot of guys within either one of those movements who, and those movements have been around for quite a number of decades who, um, are, are sort of lifers. I think of Ron Coronado, who was, um, I think he was um, an ELF activist and did some arsons and spent some time in jail. And then he kind of hit midlife, had a couple of kids, and that was it for him. Um, whereas, compare that to jihadis. Um, and there's a much sort of, while the movement is very much fueled and um, Al-Alaki basically said is that the, the, the youth are the, the root of jihad, or the foundation of jihadism. Um, and he was right about that. But I think you see much more of sort of a generational continuity um, in surveys. The, the, some of the best data that we have on fighter participation in groups like Al-Qaeda, it clearly show that most of them have a previous connection to a group and are brought in through a a family member, a friend member, something like that. And you see more of a generational continuity where um, they tend, if they don't continue to participate, they continue to be active sympathizers and continue in a way be active within the movement by helping people come in. Um, And so you you kind of have generations of jihadis, whereas I'm not sure that that's necessarily, I didn't see that to be so much the case in certain uh, other groups like the racist skin, it's like in the hammer skin nation. I'm not, I didn't see young guys who were like, well, my daddy was a hammer skin and I'm here. Um, whereas you do see that um, with a bit more frequency, I think, with mm. of, of recruitment into um, jihadist networks. Yeah, it's interesting how the ideology proliferate differently. I don't know, I don't know if that's the, the animal rights activist you just mentioned, but Coronado, I don't know if that's the one who was like a prolific pyromaniac and who then said in an interview for uh, when he was like 40 or 45 don't ask me how to do an arson or spike a tree but ask me how to plant a salad or something like that yeah 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 he's like and he said yeah exactly no you 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 know the book better than i do um no it's exactly right that was the guy and he was and i think someone's comment was that he's far less interested in the the plight of the planet uh, and its inhabitants than he is in, you know, teaching his daughter how a watermelon grows. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And it was something, something to that effect. And, and I think that very accurately characterizes what happens. And, and, you know, for a lot of, I think what it speaks to is also the idea that um, a, a lot of young people are looking for strong social identity. And they're testing out different waters. Uh, I noticed in the the racist skin movement that um, there would be a lot of people who were like, they show up for a couple of shows and then you never see them again. 
Um, in my conversations, there were a lot of people who weren't firmly entrenched in the ideology. They were just in a way checking it out. Um, they were here for the show, pay their 10 bucks, got a cup so they could drink cheap keg beer. Um, there were bands, lots of guys hanging out. Like it, it honestly, it wasn't that different from, you know, just any other sort of hardcore show. And I think it was sort of that, one of the things that accounts for that, the fact that people come and go within those scenes is that um, they, they really are in a way deeply searching for an identity, a sense of belonging and significance. And they're in a way testing out this war. Yeah. I mean, I think that to, to treat them monolithically as people tend to do, I think that it can be pretty much a problem and not the best way to approach it. For example, in your book, you talk about um, Resistance Records, who was brought by this, I forgot his name, but the guy who wrote the Turner Diaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and all these people would have been put under the banner neo-Nazi. But what it meant for some of them, like the skinheads who liked punk music and moshing and moshing and getting drunk, and the guy who was there and writing some like racist book and listening to uh, German classical yeah. music, and and so can you talk a little, a little bit about this conflict and maybe this paradox within the scene? Yeah, it it very much was that way, and I, I found it in other scenes too. Um, this was another point of similarity with the eco-animal rights militancy movement. I interviewed a guy by the name of Walter Bond um, and, and Walter had done a couple of arsons and was in jail. And um, he recounted a story to me where he was at a show and he was really trying to kind of excite people's motivation for doing things and, and uh, participating in the movement. and. He told me a story where he's sitting at the bar having a beer and this guy just turns to him and says, Walter, you're so much about the idea. Kind of like in a tone that was like, just come on, like, like stop being so much about the purpose. Like, like it's, you're so much about the, the idea of this. Um, and that was interesting to me because you're right. Like there, there are people who are just on one side of it really there because perhaps they gain a, they satisfy a deep emotional need of belonging, significance, and empowerment in their lives by participating in the scene, and maybe they're not really ideologically committed to this. Um, it, in that way, it sort of represents conversion into new religious movements, which is likened to kind of where you engage in a process of coming to accept the opinions of your friends, and ideological adoption is, happens at very end stages. It's not something that, in a way, the ideology re reaches out to you first. It's more that these groups provide a sense of identity, they provide a sense of belonging, they provide a sense of empowerment in one's life, and then the ideal ideology is just sort of tacked on and comes later. Um, that's one way it can happen. That's not to characterize it as being universal. But um, I, I found that in the eco animal rights militancy movement and getting back to the racist skinheads, yeah, I found it in that movement as well. Um, I, interestingly, I spoke to uh, one of the few women who I saw at the shows, and, and she was kind of in, she was an ideologue. Uh, she had, I think in the book, I talked about how she had visions of uh, pirating copies of Rosetta Stone so that everybody in the movement could learn German. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it was just really, it was really interesting. Like, it was, she really wanted to educate them. Um, and wanted them to have a firm commitment to the movement. And it sort of demonstrated a lack of understanding of the ideology that they had adopted. Now, interestingly, to take that a step further, it, you do see that type of thing similarly happening within jihadism, where you look at recruitment into the Islamic State, and you have to say that, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Is the actual IS fighter on the ground in the trenches, uh, how aware are they of the, the, the true ideology that is motivating their involvement in the movement? Um, there's certainly, from a lot of the interviews that we've seen, a lot of the work done by scholars, like it's, they're, they're not really able to articulate um, a lot of these seminal ideas and even talk, to, talk about people who were really pivotal in the um, 
ideological underpinnings of jihadism. Um, and so it, it's that they're getting something else out of it. You know, I, I think about it, and, and here's a good parallel, like think about the average young man or woman who is recruited into a, a Western military. Um, I, I don't think that someone who joins the U.S. Army can really talk to me about late 18th century ideas of democracy, right? They're, they're not going to talk about John Locke, and they're not going to talk about, you know, philosophers, and stuff, but yet they have signed up to risk their lives and agreed to kill other people under the name of defending this idea that, quite frankly, they don't quite understand. Um, and so it points to me to the idea that there, there's something much greater going on there for them um, than perhaps what we like to think about, which is we, we love to say ideology, uh, you know, is a big part of it. And it, I'm not separating those two. I'm not saying, well, you got on one side emotions and the other side ideology. Um, I think they're interactive. I think they inform one another. But I think that one of the things that the field would do very well in, to look at in much more your depth in trying to understand um, processes of, of recruitment, and motivation, and uh, member retention in radical movements is to look at the um, emotional and psychological rewards that are provided by participation in some of these underground radical. I mean, yeah, it's, it's extreme. it was very interesting for me to see that you managed, I mean, in all these movements, you can see like pretty big tendencies that are similar and among them the fact that they lead with music and then eventually maybe follow with ideology in all cases it's this way and for example you focus a lot about uh, on the anashid that are made by isis and other and that's what you focused on your papers with uh, nelly lahoud and you talk about trends of anashid and maybe we could talk about marvin for a second as well but mm -hmm. different tendencies that they have and the fact that it's so important for people that make these anashes that they would sound good and that they would be reminiscent of, of this or that musical tradition. So people can first like the music part of it and then maybe get into the message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's important to understand that the process of radicalization unfolds in, in a variety of different ways. One of the, the problems that has sort of plagued the field is the idea that it's either a top down or a bottom up process. And um, I don't think that helps very much. I think in some cases it's top down, in some cases it's bottom up. Um, and what we really see is the importance that different movements have placed on cultural dimensions as being a means of uh, recruitment, as a means of motivation um, and, and member retention. And, and I think that, you know, the Islamic State is a very good example of that because you kind of have to question why they would spend so much time and effort on something that could potentially undermine their theological purity at all, right? Um, and, the, you know, there's the long going debate as to what is music in Islam and what isn't. And, um, you know, without opening that Pandora's box up too much, you have to think, well, at a certain point, you just say, well, let's just produce Quranic recitation and that's it. Why are we even bothering? Um, with it. And they spend a lot of time producing these things. And the honest, you'd have a very, uh, sort of they're a multi-pronged or mul they're used in well in multiple ways, meaning that they're standalone, but they're also, um, very prominent within all the videos that they produce. So it was kind of their own soundtrack. It helped them brand. It, it did a lot of different, um, things for them. Um, but I, I also want to make clear that you know, I'm not at all suggesting a direct causal relationship that says, well, by consuming this stuff, it necessarily means that one will be on a, on a path to jihadism. That always tends to be kind of the, the standard rebuttal to some of this literature, which is, well, I've been listening to this stuff for years because I'm a researcher and I don't have any motivation to go and join the Islamic State. So obviously that, you know, it, your argument doesn't hold any water. But um, I think that and that's not at all that what I'm saying. It, it's just really kind of observing the, the trend and the tendency of people to be highly immersed within cultural products um, that we can't ignore. Um, I did a survey of all the casualty-related domestic attacks within the United States uh, that, and, and over the last, you know, maybe decade. And in almost every single one, um, 
the attacker was deeply entrenched in a world of media. Um, they were consuming this stuff um, daily. They were, you know, really kind of participating in it. Now, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the, the pivotal point to it. I think that we can't discount the idea that, that fundamentally, I still think that radicalization is a personal process, that person-to-person -person interactions are really, really pivotal, um, whether they happen in the physical space or they happen online. Um, I think that's a really, really important thing. But um, having the support of media is, and particularly music, can be very, very effective. Um, and it actually, getting back to a point that I made earlier, if you think about it, it's not necessarily about the, what the music is saying. Like in the case of Anashid, if I can introduce something to you, turn you on to a particular nasheed, we could spend a lot of time talking about that particular nasheed and bonding over that. That has nothing to do with ideology. The ideology can be like, well, you know, hey, I'll see you later. Oh, yeah, by the way, um, you know, check this thing out I was reading. Here's a pamphlet, you know? And it, it was very much kind of the way that I made connections with some of these other people. I was able to talk to Steve Drain because we both like Dallas and Chains. Um, and it, you, you make that initial connection. I think that's a really important component to it. I mean, one paradox there is that if you take uh, an ISIS-made nasheed, for example, Salil al Sawarim, and you look at the lyrics, and you also quoted the seventh verse of the French uh, national anthem, which I happen to know that I have sung. I mean, it seems to me that the lyrics of the French national anthem are much more bloody, and, and, and they seem more dangerous than the lyrics of that specific nasheed, even though it's violent as well. Mm -hmm. So there is a paradox there because, I mean, millions of French people are singing this, like, La Marseillaise, you know? And mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's, it's, yeah uh, and and with, with my point there is, is to just kind of show that it's not only in those contexts that those processes can take place, that um, music as kind of this way of bringing people together, socially bonding, giving them identity um, is, is incredibly powerful. And oftentimes we, in a way, like tolerate violence, ex explicit violence um, in some of the lyrics because it's, because um, it fulfills all those other needs. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the French anthem, I always sang it and I never realized until I actually read the lyrics I mean, it was interesting for me to read the lyrics in English because, you know, you've sung that thing so many times, you just don't realize how bloody and violent it is. Mm -hmm. And then if you read it in English, because actually, yeah, it's something that you put it in the book. You put it the thing and yeah. you're like, oh, do you know where this is from? And I was right. like, that rings a bell. I read that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. and yeah, and it was, the uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that, going back to ISIS, that the fact that they're nasheeds Anashids were so were very well produced. Mm -hmm. That was a big, big part in the attraction that they could exert on future uh, mm -hmm. converts to their ideology. And you have this paper, Trends of Anashid, mm -hmm. in which you look at different ways, uh, different tendencies, and different sources. And you also have written another paper on how these these are made using reverb and different, mm -hmm. uh, like even auto tune. Interestingly yeah. enough. You have developed with uh, Dr. Anthony F. Lemieux of Georgia State University a program called Marvin, mm -hmm. which is inspired by the Nazi Shazam. Yeah, journey. yeah, yeah. That was, it was, I'm presently part, uh, I'm glad you really brought that up. It's an interesting thing. I, I'm presently part of a um, U.S. Uh, Department of Defense funded research group that's looking at the mobilizing impact of media within the context of terrorism and political violence. And um, one of the things that we were looking at was um, kind of how we were trying to develop idea, ideas on multi, multimodal strategies within um, Islamic State propaganda, meaning that there are more than just one thing going on when you watch an ISIS video. There's sound, there's lots of things going on. So um, we really wanted to be able to figure out what was going on within the videos and what specific kind of sheet were being used and all that, because we noticed very quickly that actually um, it, they produced a lot more than they were using. 
um, in that some, they were in a way like there turned out to be kind of Islamic State hits, right? Certain Shi that they were using over and over and over again in their video messaging. Um, but we wanted a very, to be able to take a big picture um, perspective on this. And so we developed a tool that um, is basically automatic content recognition. And what that does is it can take you sort of plug in this video, you upload the video, and then it goes through the video and will through automatic content recognition will match audio within the video to our library. Um, and because I've been doing this for a long time and had collected a, a lot, if not, uh, you know, I'd say most of it, um, but we had a really good library of this stuff. And um, it actually turns out that I worked with my brother who is um, in uh, information technology and builds APIs and had done this stuff for years um, that we wanted to kind of build our own Shazam app. Uh, and I was very inspired that I, I knew at one point that the German government had thought about developing what they called the Nazi Shazam because I think believe the public broadcasts of uh, neo-Nazi music were are outlawed there. And so if there happened to be somebody who was under 18, that it represented you know, them breaking the law and they could arrest people and shut the thing down. Um, and so I thought, well, there has to be a way to do that ourselves. And so um, we, we were able to develop that. And uh, my hope is that in the long run that that has, approach has proven useful to people. There was a point at which we were contacted by a data science company in the UK, as well as the UK Home Office. Uh, we talked to people at Facebook and very other, various others, uh, kind of in the, around 2017, when it was a really hot topic about jihadism on the internet and trying to pull this stuff off and how do we go about doing it. And really what I tried to share with those people and what I hope got out uh, within the article was that music was a very good way of trying to find video. Um, and so with in an ensemble model AI approach that if you can identify the, the musical element, then you can combine that with sort of video recognition tools and other things that they had going on that it then becomes a highly, highly accurate way of being able to recognize this stuff, flag it, pull it down. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to a large degree that has, you know, hopefully that has helped um, because understanding that, understanding kind of how the, these movements work particularly jihadi movements in their efforts of branding and creating their own distinct cultural propaganda means that if you collect that stuff and you can search for it, that in a way you can kind of cut them off. Uh, because I think in like 2017, they released maybe only a couple of videos that had no soundtrack in it whatsoever. And these were kind of innocuous things. Like these were, you know, a couple of, it was a two and a half minute videos. Like you wouldn't, I guess my point was you wouldn't have missed very much at all if one had taken that approach and um you know you, they were doing that in, the, in a way like there was no way around it for them um because they were so entrenched in trying to create their own brand trying to have their distinct cultural propaganda that um when we thought about we tried to play we we, we gave a lot of thought to what well how are they going to get around this you know, okay, they realize what we're doing and how we're doing it. Well, how would they get around it, right? Well, okay, so then you just remove the soundtracks. Well, you've taken out an enormous amount of affective potency from the videos, right? Just watching those things on mute, it really loses a lot of its, I, I think, emotional impact. And, um, you know, that was one way. We, so we brainstormed a bunch of different ways and just kind of came to the conclusion that um, it was uh, something that, we'd have to react to if they made those changes, but it, it would be, it'd be very tricky, right? And they, they're not able to produce this stuff in mass or in large enough quantities that like you could have a new Nasheed, you get around it by having everything be new. You just can't do it that way. No. Um, so it, it, it turned, I, I, I'm very hopeful that that worked out well. That was really one of the goals that I have personally as a researcher is to make these types of contributions. And um, I, I'm very hopeful that it did have that impact. You, you opened a book mentioning the case of Arid Yuka, who killed two mm -hmm. American soldiers in, uh, in the Frankfurt airport in Germany. Mm -hmm. And you challenged the idea that he was a lone wolf. And I feel like, in a way, this is related to what you were just talking about, because a lot of these people seem to be radicalizing themselves, quote unquote, all by themselves, but not really, because what you called, I don't know if that's the term of your coinage, but the DG hat, 
Oh, did you hide? No, that's not, no, that's not my, I, I wished I had they come out with that. Uh, but they, yeah, there's a, they, there are lots of great terms. I think uh, Jared Brockman had a great one. He, what he called a, what he called a jihabiest. Oh yeah. Uh, which is a great term for just someone who's, you know, kind of online and it's a kind of a hobby to be a digital jihadist. Uh, you know, they're not really like in the movement, but they go online and they're inciting the fervor of uh, future jihadism. Um, but it's really sort of a, it's, it's really a hobby to them. Interesting. I like how you put it. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was just a, a tangent, but, um, but yeah, I guess my question was that also relating it to the case of Anders Breivik, who put out a manifesto in which he talks about all the methods that he put in place to quote unquote keep uh, keep himself motivated uh, over ten years and how he was like taking walks forty minutes per day listening to the music of Saga and convincing himself that you know self indoctrination as he was calling it. I'd like to have your thoughts on on like the power of of this uh, indoctrination processes and mechanisms at the age of the internet and new technologies of communications. Yeah, I think. Um, I think Breivik represents an exception to the norm. Um, there was a while there where there was a lot of sort of quote unquote lone wolf. Um, but you know, they never really stray too far from the pack. You know, um, they, the so-called lone wolf terrorism, I, I, I question whether it really is in a sense people going online and then all of a sudden like radicalizing themselves. Um, I, I think, that's not a very good way of thinking about it. But I think that if someone, if someone's online and, and they, in a way, like they, they meet certain criteria, so to speak, you know, if, if I go online and whether consciously or not in my life, I feel like I don't have significance. I feel like a social outcast. I feel like I don't have a sense of belonging. I feel disempowered and, and disenfranchised from the society I live in. Well, then in a way, like I have a certain openness to alternate ideas. Um, does that mean that I then come into contact with, you know, just speak, use myself, uh, I'm a white man, right? I like come into contact then with, you know, white nationalist ideology and does that causally mean that I then go to that movement? No, but it means that I'm far more open and perhaps receptive to those ideas. Um, particularly then when online, I can have the social relationships that can unfold and and i think there is where we see how you know the inter, in a way the, the quote unquote internet can radicalize because it gives us a forum for people to be in contact with one another and to cultivate personal interaction in ways that were unprecedented before um and, and that's where kind of i remember the white nationalist um i forget who it was but he, he was talking about you kind of the the great blessing that is the the internet um, because he said before, somebody from Nebraska and somebody from Georgia would only see one another once a year at a show, maybe twice a year at a show. Now they're getting together online every night. And that's that sense of community and creating a vibrant online cult, subculture um, can really, I think, support the um, some of these movements. In a way, it seems that... I mean, on the other hand, it can also lead them to disintegrate in a, in a sense, because, I mean, you mentioned several things, uh, contrafactum, for example, that were made by Jaish al-Islam, and that mm -hmm. were parodying actually Anashid from ISIS, mm -hmm. which is interesting. And also the fact that in the uh, environmental and animal rights activists movements, the fact that people were getting so bogged down on ideas led the movement that was supposed to be a movement of uh, action-based movement of leaderless resistance mm -hmm. caused it to uh, to become a constellations of small movements that would later be absorbed in bigger movements. Yeah. And for example, in the, uh, and also the fact that religion and Christianity is very, very controversial in uh, white nationalists or white supremacist movements because some of them define themselves as Christians and some of them reject Christianity because because they think, I mean, that it's a religion that led them to be conquered by such and such people and so on. So it's interesting to have yet another paradox mm -hmm. here. Yeah. You also mentioned another movement that we did not talk about that much, but the Christian, the Christian derived radical movements and especially the onus they put on indoctrination 
and the so-called 414 window. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I was wondering if you can talk about uh, this way of recruiting people. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I looked at, specifically when I looked at um, kind of Christian fundamentalist movements, I looked at it in two ways. I looked at Westboro Baptist Church, um, which represented obviously an, an extreme, but they were highly musical. Um, getting back to your point about contrafactum, they're actually the music that they make themselves is uh, they, they intend to ruin a song. Um, so basically what they do is they, they create their own versions of pop songs with their, with their own lyrics to it. Uh, and they, they quite openly say, my, my hope is that you hear this song because you'll never hear it the same way again. Um, and uh, so if, if you have a song that you like just to your audience, don't go listen to the Westboro Baptist version of it because you'll never like it again. Um, in, case you were, in case you were particularly curious. Um, but I, I think that I, I looked at them and then I, I looked at um, how music was used um, by leaders of, of very fundamentalist Christian organizations um, who were very sincere about their intention to indoctrinate children. Um, and the 414 window refers to, to a couple of things. It, it refers to the age where, at, at least within that this movement and its, its proselytizing efforts, they, they basically say this, if you can get someone to commit between the age of four and 14, then you've much more likely to create a lifelong member. Um, now, that, that's not, not always the most accurate way, but that's what they, they think. Um, and so the idea being that if um, you could really indoctrinate someone with beliefs at, at that between those ages, that you would create someone who really wouldn't leave the movement. Um, I think it also referred to, what was it, like the geographical position of, of, of latitude where the most, between four degrees and 14 degrees are where the most non-Christians lived. And I think it was primarily India. Um, as kind of saying, well, if you, that's where we need to be focusing our efforts at uh, conversion to Christianity. Um, and I think that also sort of encompassed a bit of the Middle East. And so it was kind of like that was you know, used uh, in, in those two ways. Um, but it was really interesting to me how important the music was to that movement in attempting to um, basically like shape these children's views. Um, and, and their point was always that your children are going to be shaped one way. We might as well have a say in it. Um, and, uh, to, to a certain degree, like I, I agree with that. Um, now a number of years later, as we see a much more peer to peer, um, influence across a lot of different radical movements, meaning that, um, the, the sort of traditional way of thinking that one would get involved potentially with a, a radical movement because you're in the community and the certain figures of authority, uh, parents, community leaders, those who are older, um, was a, a way in that you now see with much with young people who are much more invested in peer relationships because of social media, that it becomes a more linear process where um, they're much high, much more highly influenced by a small group of friends. Um, than they are from uh, parents and uh, community leaders. Um, and so their, their point with that was that, you know, you're, once you get to 14, that you're going to be much more susceptible to those, those influences. And so if you can create indoctrination at that point, um, that's the, the better thing to do. Yeah, and I think that's what uh, Steve Drain from mm -hmm. the West Coast Baptist Church was saying, is that once... Uh, their kids that are singing God Hates the World at two years old are old enough to use the internet. They are already soaked in the ideology and they, yeah. Okay, so Jonathan, towards the end of the book, um, you, you talk about the Janus-faced nature of music and the fact that all these reflections about radical music also have an implication for the music that we all listen to in our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you reference a book called The Age of Propaganda. We are so surrounded by technology and music and multimedia 
things that maybe we are just immersed in propaganda all day long and we just don't realize it. So, you know, my, my thought is, it, and my hope in the book is to perhaps invite people to be more reflective about how music can be operating in their lives. Because I believe personally that whatever we involve ourselves in uh, leaves an impression. It doesn't mean that if I play first person shooter video games that I'm actually going to go out and shoot somebody. But at the same time, I think it's also ignorant to think that if I listen to misogynist gangster rap continually, that it's not going to in some way impact how I relate to women. I, I don't think that we can kind of say that music doesn't touch us. Um, or leave a lasting impression. Again, it doesn't mean that, all right, I listen to things that are either violent or misogynist or, or, or whatever. That doesn't mean I'm going to go out and beat up my girlfriend. But I do think that it impacts us in perhaps very deep ways that we're not always uh, so conscious of. And um, when we look at music within radical culture, it's very easy to kind of say, oh, I... I see how it's operating, and but that's only within the context of radicalization and, and that those same processes of social bonding, identity, how it operates in our day-to-day -day lives aren't also at play. I, I use the idea of like you know political rallies and, and thinking about music there, and it's a way of getting us to to feel a certain way, and it, it doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with about or supporting what we think. And it, it can impact us, I think, very, very deeply. And so, uh, again, I, I don't think there's a, a causal relationship, and I'm not at all suggesting that um, people will act on, uh, you know, because they consume violent media. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think that it is a bit more subtle than simply dismissing it and saying, well, no, I, you know, I, I've been listening to Tupac for years and I'm not, you know, I don't go out and shoot people. Well, at the same time, like I do think that that, I'm not picking on Tupac, you know, but I just, I do think that it's, it leaves a lasting impression um, that can influence, influence us um, perhaps in much deeper ways than, than we're aware. And to that point, you know, I also, uh, you, you talked about kind of the Janice face of it and, and I, as a musician, I think that we do tend to idolize the arts and see them as things that should be uplifting. And, and in a way, I, I agree with that, but it's also to understand that in a way, like they're, they're not innocent. Um, music is not uh, the, the glorious sounds of angels, you know, as it was, as Andrews Breivik described how it would be when he was, would be shot down as he was, you know, going out in this blaze of glory in defense of, you know, white racial identity. And that, we would do well to kind of understand in, in understanding how it operates in these instances to then be self-reflective on how it operates in our own lives. Cause being aware of, of its power is empowerment. You know, that way you're, that way you're much more in control. And that seems to be a pervasive problem of the human condition. Cause you cite also in the book, St. Augustine of Hippo. Yeah. And he says in his confession that he, I'm going to paraphrase there, but that he feels guilty in a way because he doesn't feel the same ardent fervor when he reads verses as opposed to when he hears them sung by a choir. Yeah. And I'm going to go out on a limb there because that's really not my area of expertise or anything. But I'm wondering if maybe there is, I know there's, there's a field called evolutionary musicology mm -hmm. and wondering if there is a, uh, fitness aspect to this reaction that we have to music. I've been doing just a little bit of research and I know that some scholars seem to have argued that there is an in-group, out-group dynamic um, that music seems to have and an effect that can tighten a group or that it has also been maybe historically used by hominids to make themselves ready for battle. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. I certainly, it's certainly beyond the, the area of my expertise, but I, I will definitely say that it's um, kind of coming full circle here. Like thinking back to the, some of my interviews with the, the soldiers from the U S army that, 
they would describe the groups that would form would, would largely be based on musical, shared musical interests. Um, and the, the, you know, the guys who liked rap, they kind of came together and the guys who liked country kind of hung out together. And um, you're right. Like it, it can definitely be a way in which we set up boundaries of in and out groupness, even, you know, like within metal, like it's, um, corn fans are different from a sugar fans, right? Um, and uh, it, I, I create an out group there by wearing my Dillinger Skate Plan T-shirt, right? Um, because you're, you're either a fan or, or not. And um, it, it, but it, what it also does, though, is remember that it it then becomes this source of imagined community that I carry with me, um, because let's say you and I spent the last couple of hours talking about how we loved, you know, this or that music. And then I go and listen to it now. And I don't talk to you for a week, but every time I listen to that piece of music, um, in a way it reinforces the idea of community because we've bonded over it. And I feel that sense of belonging because I know that I have this support, social support system that enjoys that music as well. And I, I think that it, it can definitely be a source of creating groups. My, my hope is also that it can be a way of tearing those in and out group boundaries down. Yeah. Because once we start doing that, once, the moment that we have an us and a them, that it it's really is one of the first steps of the radicalization process. And if you see so much, when you read, across almost every radical group that I've looked at ever. Um, it, there's always been a very clear delineation of an in-group and out-group. And while they all navigate that terrain a little differently, um, it has really been a, a commonality. So um, hopefully as much as it, it is able to set up walls, it, it'll hopefully be able to break them down. Okay. Well, Jonathan, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. That was a very interesting conversation, and I, I'll make sure I send you that uh, Dillinger Escape and Piano Orange. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> please, please do. I'd love, I'd love to hear it. Thanks so much, Baptiste, for a terrific uh, interview. I really, really enjoyed uh, talking to you. This was um, you know, a great way to spend my afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the conversation, and now it's time for the footnotes. Footnote 1. More details about Breivik and Hale. During the conversation, Jonathan Pieslack states that he has noticed in his research that so-called lone wolves never stray far from the pack and that actually Anders Breivik is the exception to the rule. On the 22nd of July 2011, Breivik detonated a car bomb in front of government building in Oslo, Norway and then shot 69 people at a camp organized by the youth branch of the Norwegian Labour Party on the island of Utøya. He wrote a manifesto that he sent by email a few minutes before parking the explosive laden vehicle. He claims that this attack is an effort to awake West European societies from their torpor, supposedly caused by cultural Marxism, so that they can fight back against what he sees is an Islamic invasion. He never apologized and claims that the people he murdered were traitors to Europe. Breivik claims that he prepared the attacks for nine years and that he's part of a clandestine cell system named the Knights Templar. His preparation included founding a computer programming business to fund the attacks and a farming company to be able to buy fertilizers under the radar to manufacture explosives. He purposefully refrained from being in contact with other extremists in order to avoid being caught. And he used daily music listening sessions to quote, self-program, self-indoctrinate and desensitize himself. In his manifesto, he likened this practice to Muslims praying five times a day and visualized himself being shot down by the police while listening to Clint Mansell's Lux Aeterna and being in a hyper-focused, hyper-aggressive state induced by the use of ephedrine and steroids. However, when the counter-terrorism unit arrived on the island, he surrendered without resistance. Matthew Hale, as I said in the introduction, was the supreme leader of the white supremacist Church of the Creator, founded by Ben Klassen, that he renamed World Church of the Creator, and which is now known under the name 
the creativity movement. He went to law school but was barred from practicing law in Illinois as he was considered to be inciting racial hatred by the state panel evaluating him. He was represented by attorney Glenn Greenwald during the failed lawsuit. He is currently imprisoned and scheduled to be released in 2037 for inciting a member of his movement, who turned out to be an undercover FBI agent, to kill the judge that ruled against Hale's organization in a trademark infringement case. Footnote number two. The parodic songs of the Westboro Baptist Church and the role they play in the movement. As I said in the introduction, one of the goals of the Westboro Baptist Church is to spark outrage to get as much media attention as possible. Their late pastor, Fred Phelps, derives this duty from Isaiah 58, verse 1. Quoting here, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. End quote. So, the Westboro Baptist Church have become known by the general public for their extremely offensive rhetoric and pickets that are targeted at other Christians, other Americans, at veterans, and especially at homosexuals. Their statements are sometimes so extreme that they become indistinguishable from self-parody. And uh, if you want to know what I mean, I would suggest you listen to their rendition of the song Let It Go. As I was learning more about the Westboro Baptist Church, something that did not make sense to me was why they would use such insulting and polarizing methods to, quote, spread the word of God, which seemed to me to be self-defeating, to say the least, and illogical even within their framework. As it turns out, the members of the Westboro Baptist Church subscribe to the theological doctrine of the five points of Calvinism, which are remembered by the acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. A thorough examination of this doctrine is beyond the scope of this footnote, but suffice it to say that following these principles, Calvinists believe that people cannot choose God because they are either predestined to be touched by His grace or they are predestined to burn in hell. They hold that as soon as God's elect people hear the gospel, they will be saved, and it doesn't matter how the message is delivered, which explains why the Westboro Baptist Church tries to reach as many people as possible and in the way they do. Footnote number three, glossolalia and altered states of awareness. So here's how Peace Lack defines glossolalia, also called speaking in tongues by practitioners. Glossolalia represents a language of spiritual possession by the Holy Spirit. While it was originally thought to be a language that would unite humanity by way of a single linguistic form, it is today considered to be indicative of an experience of the Holy Spirit's, quote, fire. Early studies considered glossolalia to be a psychopathological disorder. In her book entitled Deep Listeners, Music, Emotion and Trancing, ethnomusicologist Judith Becker argues that religious practices such as glossolalia, singing and listening to music, facilitate trance by stimulating neurochemical activity associated with emotion. Footnote number four. More details on the straight edge movement. Here is a short, simplified description of the straight edge movement. The term straight edge was coined in 1981 by Ian McKay, the singer of the band Minor Threat, in the song of the same name. And the idea is soon mixed with other ideas present in the hardcore scene at the time, such as DIY, anarchism, primitivism, and notoriously veganism with vegan straight edge. Straight edgers are more or less tolerant of outsiders and opponents to their ideology and range from quote unquote posy for positive to militant. Hardline is an offshoot of Vegan Straight Edge, created by the band Vegan Reich. Members advocate intolerance and violent action against non-vegans and are, quote, combatively pro-life with a homophobic bent, as they view sex as a vehicle only suited to procreation. McKay himself claims to have been threatened by hardliners, who told him that he would get hurt if he did not endorse their ideas. The last thing I would like to say about Straight Edge is that it should be clear that the few extremists that I have just described represent a very small percentage of the straight edgers who are mainly pacific. For what it's worth, I've only had good experiences with the ones I've met so far. Footnote 5. The Dark Side of the Tune. The Dark Side of the Tune is a book published in 2008 by Bruce Johnson and Martin Clunan, focused on the historical and current use of music to promote violence, in association with it, or as a weapon. Nowadays, 
in the Western world at least, music is widely understood to be omnipositive. And this is the vision that Johnson, Clunan and Pizak are challenging in their respective books. In the book The Dark Side of the Tune, a conversation that the musicologist Walter Kaufman had with an Indian classical musician is quoted. The conversation took place in Bombay in 1934, and in it, the Indian musician expresses his frustration with the relationship that Westerners have to music. He says, quote, Do you know that you people in the West will soon experience a most terrible disaster? And do you know why? Because you people in the West abuse music and perform it at wrong times and occasions. You play funeral marches and sing dirges when there is no funeral and no cause for sadness. You sing love songs and spring songs when there is neither love nor spring. You play nocturnes during the day, wedding music when there is no wedding. How long will the universe tolerate this abuse of music, mind you, a most sacred thing? The reason why I've included this quote here, and the reason why I think it's interesting, is because it hints at all the different possible relationships that we could have with music. And it tends to show that the one we have at the moment is very contingent, and as a matter of fact, this musician had a very different approach and understanding of the musical phenomenon. Footnote number six. Project Schoolyard USA. Panzerfaust Records, now known as Tightrope Records, is one of the labels that filled that vacuum left by the resistance records conflict that I mentioned in the introduction of the podcast. In the case of Panzerfaust Records, the owners of the label truly believed that racist punk rock music could help spread their ideas, and they launched Project Schoolyard USA, inspired by an initiative by German nationalists. They pressed and distributed 100,000 CDs to kids and teenagers, and the mediatic outreach that ensued gave them a lot of free publicity. This is yet another example of a common thread between radical movements, namely the effort to reach and convert young people to their ideals. Footnote 7. Recasting Metal. So you have the link to the paper in the description if you'd like to read it for yourself. And I also want to correct what I said during the conversation. The paper was published in 2007 and not 2008. Footnote number 8. Meshuggah's EP, I. Meshuggah's one-track EP, I, was released in 2004. And something else that Jonathan Pizak pointed out in his paper and that I thought was interesting was that the pitch band at 3 minutes 33 was not there merely to serve as a transition between two parts of the song, but that its duration was also exactly closing the hypermeasure and thus preserving the hypermetric structure. It's also the only occurrence, as far as I know, of such a pitch band in the music of Meshuga, which goes to show that this song is really something that they never planned to play live and that it's more of a studio experiment. I think that generally, a lot of Meshuggah's uniqueness comes from their creative process, which consists in writing and programming riffs in isolation rather than jamming them out like earlier bands had to. Their songs tend to be more composed and less improvised, which leads to a more intricately connected result. I also think that this is a defining characteristic of Dream Theater's writing process and of a lot of modern metal that both Meshuggah and DT influenced. Footnote number 9. Different schools of music theory. In his doctoral thesis titled Conflicting Analytical Approaches to Late 19th and Early 20th Century Tonal Music, a Meta-Theoretical Study, Jonathan Pieslack builds a framework to compare and assess different analytical approaches to tonal music, and his framework is inspired by Foucault's Triangle. The three approaches he looks at are Schenkerian, Schoenbergian, and Neo-Riemannian analysis. The first, is derived from the work of music theorist Henrik Schenker and consists in relating music to a simpler and deeper structure named the Ursatz. Schoenbergian analysis gets its name from composer and music theorist Arnold Schoenberg, who made 12 tone serialism famous and theorized it. Also known as dodecaphony, this method consists in arranging the 12 notes of the chromatic scale in tone rows to prevent the preeminence of any one note and to avoid the emergence of a tonal framework. Finally, neo-Romanian theory is a loose connection of ideas that can be found in the works of several music theorists. The most famous of them is David Lewin. The main feature behind neo-Romanian theory is the ability to relate different harmonies to each other without necessarily having to refer them back to a tonic. So that was a very succinct and schematic overview of the three analytical approaches that Pieslack discusses in his thesis, and I would encourage you to dig a little bit deeper if you're interested.
Here are some of the modern tools that he uses in his paper Recasting Metal to deconstruct the song I. I'm quoting him here. Lerdal and Jackendorf's concept of grouping structure, Lester's idea of textual accent, and Rudder's pulse stream relationships to explain the different ways hypermeter and large scale rhythm is stratified, as well as Yeston's concept of attack point interval analysis, which is useful in observing foreground rhythmic details. Underlying each approach is an epistemological foundation in what Justin London describes as, quote, the hierarchical aspects of rhythm and form, end quote. And these different ideas intersect one another as methods of architectonic analysis. Footnote number 10. Music theory and the Dillinger escape plan. I did not end up mentioning him in the conversation, but Calder Hannan, that I had the pleasure to have on the fifth episode of the podcast, wrote a paper titled Difficulty as Heaviness, Links Between Rhythmic Difficulty and Perceived Heaviness in the Music of Meshuga and the Dillinger Escape Plan. In this paper, he describes the challenges associated with transcribing and representing the music of Dillinger. We also discuss it during the podcast, which is linked in the description. Footnote 11. Eric Smialek's paper on Meshuga. The paper that I am referring to during the conversation is Eric Smialek's master thesis, which is entitled Rethinking Metal Aesthetics, Complexity, Authenticity and Audience in Meshuga's Eye and Catch 33. Footnote number 12. Dr. Olivia Lucas. I had the pleasure to have Dr. Lucas on the third episode of the podcast, in which we discuss Meshuga's light show, as well as many other things. The link is available in description. Footnote number 13. Dancers of a Fractured Method. The piece that I am referring to is called Dancers of a Fractured Method and was written in 2009 by Jonathan Peaslike for Percussion Quartet. The link is available below. Footnote 14. Prednisomnia. Prednisomnia is the last piece of shards the solo piano album composed by Jonathan Pieslack and played by Robert Oller. The album was released in 2014. Jonathan Pieslack also released a metal arrangement of the piece and both versions are available in description. Footnote number 15. The 43 person burnt piano arrangement. The piano arrangement that I am referring to was published on the YouTube channel Sequoia Sounds. Link available below if you would like to hear it for yourself. Footnote 16. Nelly Lahoud, Thomas Heghammer, and the book Jihadi Culture. Dr. Nelly Lahoud is a researcher focused on the ideology and evolution of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, and she co-wrote the article The Anashid of the Islamic State, Influence, History, Text and Sound with Jonathan Pieslack, which was published in the Studies in Conflict and Terrorism Journal. They also both contributed to the book Jihadi Culture, edited by the jihadism and terrorism expert Thomas Heghammer. Footnote number 17. More details on the Hammerskin Nation. The Hammerskin Nation is an American white supremacist and racist skinhead group founded in 1988 in Dallas, Texas. Their primary focus is to publish and spread white power music and to organize festivals and gatherings. Their logo is inspired from the one of the fascist party in the 1982 film Pink Floyd, The Wall. Hammerskins are co-opted based on their involvement and longevity in the scene. Their attire indicates their place in the hierarchy, which can be hangaround, supporter, prospect of the nation, or fully patched hammerskin. Becoming a fully initiated member takes three to four years on average. But despite these measures, as I said in the introduction, the skinhead scene is notoriously transitory, meaning that its members come and go. And the hammerskin nation is not exempt to this rule, even though it does a better job of retaining its members than other movements do. The movie American History X did a good job of depicting this aspect of the racist skinhead scene. It also shows the aversion that skinheads have for drugs other than alcohol, with main character Derek Vineyard asking a member of the racist group to stop smoking weed and insultingly associating the behavior with black people. Indeed, the use of drugs has caused many controversies in skinhead circles. To give just one example, Anthony Pierpont, the co-founder of the aforementioned label Panzerfaust Records, was arrested with weed and cocaine, and this sparked outrage in the scene to the extent that he had to step down and that they had to rename the label Tightrope Records. Footnote number 18. Music and Islam. The topic of music and Islam has been controversial since the religion's funding in the 7th century. Cases based on various surahs and hadiths have been made for and against the art form, and the issue is still disputed. The definition of music itself is problematic. 
The fatwas, or legal decisions, on the subject tend to be ambiguous and don't really provide clear and unequivocal criteria to determine whether or not a piece qualifies as musica. A good example of what we might consider music in Occident, but which is decidedly not in Islam, is sacred cantillation. For example, in the cases of Adhan, the call to prayer, and of the Kira'a, which are forms of Quranic stylized recitation. Liminal cases include chants featuring less directly scriptural themes or incorporating accompanying instruments or post-processing. The jihad-themed anashid that we discuss during the conversation are in this grey zone. Interestingly, they often incorporate elements of musical traditions that listeners might be familiar with, such as makam, which are melodic modes in Arabic music, and such as autotune, which is prominently present in many pop and rap songs in the West. Footnote 19. The consequences of the internet and of mass media on radical movements. Anwar al Olwaki was a Yemeni-American imam involved in recruitment and terrorist operations for Al-Qaeda. In his book 44 Ways to Support Jihad, he stressed the importance of what he called, quote, WWW Jihad, inspired by Al-Qaeda operative Muhammad bin Ahmad al-Salem, who called the internet a, quote, blessed medium. This focused on internet recruitment is a commonality shared by all of the movements examined in radicalism and music. According to Colin Gilmore, a sociologist and expert on the hate rock movement, the internet is considered by white supremacists to be a great opportunity to cater to a larger audience and to reach younger people. If we take a step back, it's interesting to reflect on the impact of modern media on fringe movements and radical ideologies. In the 10th chapter of his book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Yuval Noah Harari draws a straight line between the developments of terrorism and the mediatic exposure of Western societies. He argues that the terrorists' goal is to prey on the rapid flow of news and information to try to destabilize Western societies, which is the only way for them to cause lasting damage. He likens it to a fly irritating a bull in the hopes that it would destroy a china shop. Footnote number 20. The lyrics of the French national anthem. The verse of the French anthem that we discuss is known as the children's verse. It is rarely sung and its origin is disputed. It was not written by Rouget de Lille, the author of the anthem, and its author is not decisively known. Here is a translation of it. We shall enter in the military career when our elders are no longer there. There we shall find their dust and the trace of their virtues. Much less jealous to survive them than to share their coffins, we shall have the sublime pride of avenging or following them. And it's true that it's hardly distinguishable from the Anashid lyrics that we have discussed. Here is a translation of the verse and of the chorus that are usually sung. Arise, children of the fatherland, the day of glory has arrived. Against us, tyranny's bloody standard is raised. Bloody standard is raised. Do you hear, in the countryside, the roar of those ferocious soldiers? They're coming right into your arms to cut the throats of your sons, your women. To arms, citizens, form your battalions. Let's march, let's march. Let an impure blood water our furrows. So here it is. I feel like it's even more violent than the verse that I read before. And I must say that I have an interesting feeling of jamais vu when I'm reading it in English. It's a violent song from violent times. The French Revolution was unquestionably bloody and even genocidal, according to some historians, which is yet another fiercely debated issue. It's also important to say that the time period's portrayals and some of its aspects are still very controversial in France to this day. Some have been trying to somewhat downplay the violence of the lyrics. For example, there's a theory positing that the impure blood mentioned in the chorus is the blood of the citizens in an ironic opposition to the pure blue blood of the nobility and of the clergy. But according to what I've read, this theory doesn't hold water. And the impure blood being mentioned here is in fact the blood, as you would assume, are the so-called enemies of the revolution. Footnote 21. The age of propaganda and some thoughts on bias and impartiality. The Age of Propaganda is a book written by Anthony Pratt Canis published in 1992. In it, the author argues that never before has propaganda been so ubiquitous, emotionally persuasive and subconsciously effective. He shows how political and religious leaders, advertisers and sales agents appeal to the emotions of viewers to influence their behavior. Fundamentalist Christians, who start indoctrinating children at an early age, are aware of this and defend their methods of education by claiming that a child is going to be indoctrinated by something anyways. 
I must say that it reminds me of the academics or journalists that we discussed, who claim that reporting facts in a perfectly impartial manner is impossible, and who use that excuse to produce work that is completely colored by whatever bias they have. It seems to me that in both cases, they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and that endeavoring to be as non-partisan as possible in such cases should be better incentivized. On the flip side, it's important to develop good critical thinking skills and to recognize that this is water, as David Foster Wallace would say. Footnote number 22, the full quote from St. Augustine's of Hippo's Confessions. Here is the full quote, which was written at the very end of the 4th century. But if I am not to turn a deaf ear to music, which is a setting for the words which give it life, I must allow it a position of some honor in my heart, and I find it difficult to assign it to its proper place. For sometimes I feel that I treat it with more honor than it deserves. I realize that when they are sung, these sacred words stir my mind to greater fervor and kindle in me a more ardent flame of piety than they would if they were not sung. So I waver between the danger that lies in gratifying the senses and the benefits which, as I know from experience, can accrue from singing. Footnote 23. Evolutionary Musicology the evolutionary musicology research that I mentioned at the end of the conversation are the article Music and Dance as a Coalition Signaling System by Hagen and Bryant and Joseph Jordania's 2011 book Why Do People Sing? Music in Human Evolution. Footnote number 24, the 10 stages of genocide. In 1996, Gregory Stanton, the founding president of Genocide Watch, presented a briefing paper called The Eight Stages of Genocide at the U.S. Department of State. In it, he suggested that genocide develops in eight stages that are predictable but not inexorable. In 2012, he added two stages to the list. Please bear in mind that these stages are not linear and often occur simultaneously. Stage 1 is classification, division between us and them. Stage 2 is symbolization. Combined with hatred, symbols may be forced upon unwilling members of paria groups. Stage 3 is discrimination, Law or cultural power excludes groups from full civil rights. Segregation or apartheid laws, denial of voting rights. Stage 4 is dehumanization. One group denies the humanity of the other group. Members of it are equated with animals, vermin, insects or diseases. Stage 5 is organization. Genocide is always organized. Special army units or militias are often trained and armed. Stage 6 is polarization. Hate groups broadcast polarizing propaganda. Stage 7 is preparation. Mass killing is planned. Victims are identified and separated out because of their ethnic or religious identity. Stage 8 is persecution. Expropriation, forced displacement, ghettos, concentration camps. Stage 9 is extermination. It is extermination to the killers because they do not believe their victims to be fully human. Stage 10 is denial. The perpetrators deny that they committed any crimes. So these are the 10 stages of genocide. Okay, well, that was it for the footnotes. It was really a pleasure for me to talk to Jonathan Pieslack, and I hope that you enjoyed the podcast as much as I did. I must say that this episode was not an easy one for me. First of all, because preparing the interview, the introduction and the footnotes took me dozens of hours, and also because the material that I've had to watch and to engage with was sometimes really, really intense. But I don't regret it. It was a great experience and I hope that you enjoy listening to it. That was Baptiste Vatiez for Expo. See you next time.